Dr. Ellen Kirschman. Welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Well, thank you so much for being here. And I have to thank Craig Kingsman of the Cops and Writers Facebook group for suggesting you for this interview. You know, I have heard of your book. I think most cops have heard of your book, either at an in-service or something along those lines. I love a cop is, I think the first time I heard of it was at an orientation for new cops when they brought their spouses or partners and it's like, here's a good book for you to understand what's going to be going on here. So I always knew of you and your book, but I never put it together until Craig is like, hey, you should really have her on the show. And I'm like, absolutely. Of course I should have her on the show. So here we are. And I couldn't be more happy. So my first question to you is, have you ever loved a cop? Never. Oh. I've loved a cop. I've never had a date with a cop. Um <laughs> Uh, I would have probably uh, lost my reputation had I done such. So, uh, but I do love a firefighter, and that would have been my brother, who was a volunteer firefighter. Oh, okay. Years. And I have a book called "I Love a Firefighter" as well. So, um, no, but no, people ask me that all the time <laughs> if I've ever been married to a cop. No. Mm -mm. Well, neither have I. That was one of my rules. And, you know, I went through a divorce and, you know, of course I started dating again and my friends are like, are you going to date a cop? And I'm like, first off, I'm a boss. That's, that's a huge no, no, you're asking for trouble and the dating pool amongst people of my rank are maybe a little bit higher is pretty shallow. Plus I don't want to date another cop. I, I don't want to live with another cop. I just don't. Right. I remember my first day in the Academy and I, I'm, I didn't, uh, let me ask you this. My first day in the Academy, they said, well, you know what? The national divorce rate is like about 50%, give or take. All right, congratulations. You're all cops. Now it's about 80%. And the guy's like, if you're ever silly enough to marry another cop, now it's up to about 90. Have you well, ever heard any stats regarding that? Yeah, I, th I hear those stats all the time and they are inaccurate. And okay. I do my best to uh, counter them because otherwise it's like giving people a you know self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm doomed to get divorced because I'm a cop. Um, as a matter of fact, I think cops are somewhere down around uh, ninth on a list of professions with high divorce rates. Really? I wouldn't have yeah. guessed that. And when you break that out into what kind of a cop and, you know, are you a, a detective? Are you a street cop? Are you a railroad cop? Are you a... Right. It, it sort of breaks out a little bit differently. But the highest the highest divorce rates are... You, you care to guess what professions have the highest divorce rates? Oh, boy. Psychiatrists? No. Uh, dentists? Well, I, won't, I, I, don't... Won't, I won't torture you. Okay. So uh, bartenders... Dancers, oh, I could see that. Yeah. Dancers, they don't say what kind of dancer and uh, massage therapists. Uh, okay. What we know that influences divorce uh, largely depends on what state you're in, because people in the south of the United States get divorced most more. And perhaps that has to do with education levels or mm. age at marriage. Nobody really knows. Yeah. And these, these, all of these statistics are very um, dicey because people don't have to, uh, particularly law enforcement, you don't have to report divorce. So it's really hard to know accurately. What I do know is that we shouldn't be telling people that they're going to be doomed to be divorced because uh, that sends really a very negative message that isn't true. Yeah, I I remember coming home that night and I did not tell my then wife, now my ex-wife. <laughs> it's like, you know, and I'm like, okay, I really don't want this. You know, it's yeah, I'd much rather stay married than be divorced. But yeah, you know, amongst my peers and the people that I worked with, I'd say it was a little higher than 50% for divorces. And I worked on the street in really high crime areas most of my career. So that's one of the problems. You had a bird's eye view of the people around you. That is totally different from national statistics. Right, right. 
That's what people say, because everybody I know is divorced. That must be true for the entire profession. What sure. we really should be people, and part of the reason I wrote I Love a Cop, is not that you're going to get divorced, but here are the things you need to do to strengthen your marriage. Here are the things that you need to do um, to have an enduring marriage. But the message, of course, is not one that police departments care to give because the message is put your family in front of your job. Yes. Because the message is this is not your identity. It's just your job. The message is your family has to come first. Um, uh, management doesn't want to say that to you. They want you to right. give everything you got and, and they don't care who gets hurt in the process to your job. Well, this is a rabbit hole I didn't expect, but I think it's fun because like most like young cops, well, I was 30 years old. I was actually kind of old when I first started the job compared to the 21 year olds running around. You know, I had visions of being a canine officer, a motorcycle cop, a SWAT operator. And I'm like, man, all that stuff would be so cool. But then I quickly figured out and discovered that, okay, you want to be a SWAT guy. All right. Well, you're going to have to work second shift, which is four in the afternoon or three in the afternoon to like 11, 12 o'clock at night. And it's like the same thing for the motorcycles in most specialty units. That's where you start. And I was working midnight to eight on the graveyard, but the graveyard worked good because my wife worked day shift. She had a normal job. So at least, you know, we would be able to see each other. You know, if I worked four in the afternoon till midnight, I would never see her. I mean, just like on an occasional off day, but other than that, ships right. passing in the night. And then when kids came along, I wanted to go to their football games, their basketball games. I wanted to be an active parent. And that's not going to happen if you're working that shift. It's, you know, it's like all the stuff happens after school. Mm -hmm. So guess what? You know, I chose my family before the job. I had plenty. I knocked down plenty of doors. I knocked out. I had, I had all kinds of policey fun where I didn't have to do that. Then I promoted and I stayed on the late shift for quite some time. I was what, 13 years on midnight to eight. And then I worked 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. for four years. So not until the kids got like much older, then I got divorced and then I eventually went day shift. But if, again, if I would have chose the job over the family, yeah, I mean, I would have been in, I could have done some really high speed fun stuff, but then I never would have been able to see my kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a pitfall. Yeah, no, it is a pitfall. The shift work is really tough. Now, cops aren't the only people in the world that do shift work, for right. sure. Uh, and I, th I think that one of the things that's important when you are doing work with officers at the academy level with the new hires, and you tell them things about how this job is going to interfere with your relationships and how some of the skills you have on the street do not work well at home. Not only do they not work well, they were probably damaging to your personal relationships. We tell them that, but it's sort of like uh, trying to do premarital counseling with people who are deeply in love. They can't hear it. There's <laughs> yeah. no bell. These young folks have, the new hires have no roadwear. There's, they have no Velcro for this information. They just sit mm. in the room and say, oh, well, I won't make that mistake. That'll never happen to me. And it's so we have to go back and do that same orientation. And they'll give those same warnings and the same skills for dealing with your family. We have to do that again, maybe three to five years later. You know, now I think some experience. They know what you're talking about. Right. I think that's somewhere where most departments do drop the ball. And later on, you know, they can't figure out why officer X, Y, or Z is becoming a problem child, quote unquote, or they're having these issues and that issues. And it's like, okay, because, you know, these other things that may, maybe, or maybe not could have been cut off at the pass by like, let's address this. Let's talk about this. It never happened. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm totally on board with you that there, but 
maybe we'll circle back to that later. But yeah, I was I was looking at your website, which is actually very good. That's I, I really like your website. You know, I've looked at a lot of author websites and you have a really good one. I, I'm very impressed with that. I can uh, recommend the people who do it for me. Who's They're that? Wonder Zuni, X-U-N-I dot com. Okay. They do a lot of author websites. They are the, it's a mom and a son. They're okay. the closest people, responsive, fast. They also do my newsletter. Um, they're, they are really terrific people. I can't recommend them. Yeah. Just, it's very, uh, eye popping. It's, you know, it's like you look and you're like, Oh, wow, that's, that's neat. You know, it's, it's, it's put together really well. But one thing that I noticed was there was a, a police star, you know, I guess they call it a star in Milwaukee, their badges and Chicago, their stars and New York, their shields, you know, but it was at the Palo Alto uh, police department had like a star. You had it in like, um, lexicon. Yes. So what's the story behind that? Well, I've, you know, I've always been a, a uh, independent consultant, but I consulted with Palo Alto for 25 years. Okay. I was there uh, uh, um, in-house uh, two days a week for 25 years, along oh, wow. with other, other departments. Yeah. Now you were there as like a police psychologist or? Yeah. Okay. You know, our department was very late in the game. You know, I I retired in 20 and probably five or six years before I retired, they thought, hey, let's have a police chaplain. And then it's like, okay, we need police psychologists. And this was after a really tough patch of officer suicides. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, and there was a bunch of us saying, you know, long, long before that, we need help. And, you know, of course, it turned to a deaf ear, but thank God we have the right people doing that job. It has to be the right ones. So that's my third book. My third nonfiction book is called Counseling Cops, What Clinicians Need to Know. And I wrote that with um, two of my psychology colleagues, Joel Fay and Mark Kamina, and they're both retired cops. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I thought that having them doing this with them was going to make this a more readable and sure. more grounded, grounded book because we know that it's hard enough to get a cop to reach out, to admit they need help, then to right. reach out, to get help. And if they don't get a culturally competent clinician, somebody who understands cops, knows what they do and why they do it, they're apt to be uh, really turned off. Yeah, it has to be the right fit. Like our police chaplain was a Milwaukee police officer. He was a vice detective for mm -hmm. 15 years. And you now he he knows the nuts and bolts of the job. The two police psychologists that we have, one is married to a police officer in a different city. And the other one, her dad was a Milwaukee cop for 30 years. Great. So they know they they are immersed in the culture and they understand that because culture is everything when it comes to policing. Yes. And none of it was pushed on anyone. That was the main thing. And the guarantee of, hey, if you come to me with X, Y, or Z problem, your lieutenant, your sergeant, the chief, whoever is not going to know about this, you know, this there's confidentiality between us. Right. My office in Palo Alto was on the flight path between the briefing room and the locker room. And the cops set it up that way uh, because they wanted to sort of normalize talking sure. to me. Uh, but I can also tell you the day I left after 25 years, uh, there were still people in the organization who were absolutely convinced I had a video feed right that went in my office oh. and went right up to the chief. <laughs> so, you know, there's there are definitely some people that will never be convinced. Right. Anybody who talked to me knew that whatever they said stayed within the two of us. Sure. So how did you get started in helping others, more specifically police officers with trauma, you know, that kind of stuff? Hmm. Well, it's a long story. I've been doing this for a long time. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll try to shorten the story. There was right. a, a time I was uh, a clinical social worker working in the psychiatric unit of uh, a big hospital 
Um, and I started seeing police wives coming in to see me and they would tell me what was going on at home. And I was somewhat alarmed by what I was hearing. And what you would ordinarily do is say, well, bring your husband in. This is a time when there were very few, there's still very few female cops, but uh, there almost always it was the spouse, the wife who came yeah. to therapy. The minute I said, bring in your husband, um, they never, the husbands never showed up and uh, pretty soon the women disappeared because mm. no, that uh, the husband was saying, you can't talk about what goes on here. You know, that the stigma and the fear about being put in the, the rubber room, the minute anybody hears about what I'm yep. doing it on the rubber room. So that got me really interested in, in what was going on with policing. I have a, I, I have been a probation officer in the past for oh, okay. a couple of years, not a long mm -hmm. time. And, and I, I was also really bored with what I was doing for the most part as, as a social worker. So I put together a class called I Love a Cop. This is 1977, mind Wow. You. Okay, that's pretty, that's groundbreaking. Long time ago, it was very groundbreaking. Yeah. I went up to the local community college, and lo and behold, the public relations director of the college was married to a cop. So they pulled her in on this conversation, and she said, oh, this is a great idea. I think it's really important. So we put together a class called I Love a Cop and the college catalog went out and the day it went out, the class was filled and there were 40 women on the waiting list. Wow. I thought, all right, there's definitely a need out there. And yeah. that propelled me to go back to college. I quit my job. I went back to college, got my doctorate in psychology and did my dissertation looking at stress in police work. It was kind of a combination of Sigmund Freud and Mickey Spillane. You know, I, <laughs> I love, I'm sort of a trauma junkie. I love the drama and the reality of what goes on in the world of law enforcement. I am not so interested in talking to people who are uh, irritated with their supervisors or whining. I'm not good with whiners. So, um, and then cops, when they, if they whine, at least they whine very loudly and curse a lot. So they're more interested. <laughs> um, so that got me back, got my doctorate. And then people just started hiring me to come in and do some of this family work because mm. nobody else was, was doing it. So that, and I, I really felt very comfortable working in law enforcement more so than I did when I was just seeing your ordinary kind of client because I I like to laugh I like to talk I'm a very I'm active I'm directive and that's just the sort of person that a cop is most comfortable with yeah you're absolutely right about that so when did um I love a cop come to fruition when was the first iteration of that book First iteration was, I think, 1997. Okay, okay. It so It took me 20 years to write it. I mean, not that I was working on it all 20 years, but I needed that experience. Right, you know, that's the thing. If you would have wrote that book when you just got done with your doctoral dissertation, it wouldn't have been as good because you, you didn't have the meat and potatoes behind it. Right, I, didn't, I did not have the experience. Since then, I've worked in... Um, 23 states in the United States, four okay. different countries. I've worked for um, the DEA. I've worked for um, the Border Patrol. I've worked for, uh, uh, I've been to the FBI Academy a bunch of times, about three times, I think. Cool. I'm, I'm, so I've had very broad experience because I'm an independent contractor. So I was not just attached to one place. Yeah. So, you know, I love a cop. My first recollections, I think I alluded to this earlier, was my younger days as a cop being PowerPointed to death at an in-service. And it's like some in some instructors like you should really get this book. And it's like, yeah, OK, whatever. I'm trying to keep my eyes open because I'm working late shift. Yeah. You know, and then it's like, hey, you have to go to in-service tomorrow. And you're like, oh, God, you know, eight hours of sitting in a classroom. We we're just like, oh, Lord. But I do remember it popping into my head. And I talked to other cops who I respected and they just sang its praises. And I'm like, oh, okay. And we're not an easy crowd to please by any stretch of the imagination. So 
have you or how many times have you had cops or their significant others come up to you and say, hey, thanks for writing this book? I, I can't tell you. I've lost count. And my I, at least once or twice a month to this day, there's been three three editions of uh, this I Love a Cop book. So I've updated it three different times. The most recent edition was about two years ago. Yeah, so, I, I just finished reading that book about a month ago. My only suggestion is I, I love audio. Could you please do it in audio? Oh, uh, well, I'm, uh, the audio is expensive and I love is. My, my own audios, but it takes too long, apparently. Okay. Yeah, to answer your question, uh, Patrick, that I get a lot of compliments about the book. At least twice a month, I get an email from somebody that says help in the subject line. Um, because it's gotcha. a family that's falling apart or yeah. they need or something. Um, but countless, uh, it's very gratifying to me that I was part of the at the beginning of a movement that said, look, these are human beings doing these impossible jobs and they have families and they need attention and they need help. And so it's very gratifying. I think the most common most common response I get from somebody that's been on the job for a while or from their spouse is, I wish I had had this book 20 years ago. Yeah. So what does it mean to you when you have just strangers saying, you know, hey, thank you, you know, for writing this book, et cetera? It means the world to me. I mean, it it, it validates uh, uh, the work I've done. It, you know, it validates the effort I put in. It makes me very happy. So, you know, you had mentioned earlier that, you know, you're a contractor and you've talked to, you know, state, federal, you know, law enforcement, you know, getting ready for a presentation in front of a bunch of cops. I know that could be daunting when you're not a cop. You know, how do you get ready for this? And what's the self-talk before you take the mic? Well, you know, I think you'd have to ask me that doing what year of my career, because I okay. can talk self-talk today, now, currently is, um, well, I, I like to joke that when I walk in a room, a little old lady with gray hair, it, I have to drop an F-bomb in the budget for <laughs> five minutes to get anybody's attention. <laughs> or I bring, I have stress balls that I've had made up with my name on them, and I throw them at people sometimes, <laughs> make sure they're awake so they don't get, <laughs> get in the head. But, you know, these days um, I have enough credibility and enough experience that I can say damn near anything I want to say. And uh, so I'm not really all that worried about it. And if people have got their sunglasses on and they're reading the newspaper in the back of the room, well, that's their problem. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not, um, I don't need more work. I don't need any of the things I needed when I was much younger doing this. Right. Sure. And I don't get it on at all. So that doesn't happen. Any, so that's not a problem. Okay. Now, do you have any examples where it kind of started ugly, but you won them over? Well, this is, a, yeah, a different kind of example. I was going, sure. this is the first one that popped in my head. I was going uh, up for a job uh, consulting with a, a moderate sized police department uh, somewhere here in the Bay Area. And the cops had been interviewing or uh, listening to a woman from a rape crisis center mm -hmm. before. And she walked out of the room and then they invited me in and I sat down and they were talking about how ugly she was. <laughs> and I, I had to stop, I had to think for a minute, but and I said to them, I didn't think that uh, being good looking had anything to do with getting the job. For example, look at yourselves. <laughs> you know, That's a perfect I, comeback. Oh my God. That that kind of um that kind of sexism has come up. You know, I can walk in a room. Um, I was in a, teaching in a reserve academy and uh, I walked in the room and people asked when the teacher was coming. Because they were expecting a man, not a woman. So there's been that kind of stuff. Um, when I do workshops for couples, 
um, which are very difficult to manage because we're, we're doing a lot of different things with uh, the participants. I much prefer to do that with um, my colleague, Joel Fay, who is, because he's a male and because he has 35 years on the job mm. and is also a psychologist, I can talk to the spouses and he, and he can get the attention of the officers and they're much more likely to pay attention to what's going on. The men in the room are much more okay. likely to pay attention to what's going on when he's there. And both of us don't have to work quite as hard as we do if we're doing something like that by ourselves. So we enjoy working together, playing off each other. That yeah, sort of thing. that makes total sense to me. So I love a cop. One of the many things that I loved about this book was you actually offer solutions to problems. It's not a bunch of vague catchphrases or obscure theories. How did you get so authentic? Yeah, I mean, I know it's through experience, you know, talking to cops and their families, but you must be doing it with purpose. And were you like taking notes? It's like, okay, this worked, you know, this person responded pretty good with this or how did that work? Well, yeah, I mean, I do take notes. I do listen to other people. I think, you know, it's not easy to write a self-help book no. and, and without sounding like a pompous idiot. Right, right. So um, I didn't want to sound like a pompous idiot. I uh, uh, There was a, a series of books written, self-help books that I really loved called, I love, a, I love um, no, The Dance of Intimacy, The Dance of Anger, and a couple more dance books uh, by Harriet Goldhorn Lerner. And I recommend those books to this day. Okay. She was a model for me because I thought she, that her books were really, to use your word, authentic. Mm -hmm. I know that that um, cops, law enforcement, and the, the people who were associated with them, like their spouses, um, really need some direction they they do not do well with clinicians who don't answer questions and won't give advice so you know to, if somebody asks me a question about myself or what they should do you know the the traditional way i was trained is to say to somebody well what would you do with that information or, <laughs> or why are you asking that question and i realize that what keeps cops safe is information right you don't go into a, a hopefully you don't go into a blind alley without figuring out you know where's the, where can I get out of here and who's in there and where's my backup and all that same goes for their families so uh, people really want something that is uh, not abstract but concrete and it can be actually helpful and I learned from the families that I worked with and the officers I worked with what worked for them and what didn't work for them. And mm -hmm. I just put that in you know, the book. Do you have a couple of examples of what works well in, you know, like a police family trying to keep everybody happy and together? Well, yeah, the thing I mentioned earlier, there has to be a commitment that the family comes first. And that uh, also there has to be a commitment that this is a, the, a commitment to communication. Um, and what happens in an awful lot of police families, and I'm really empathetic to this, is that the cops, you'll hear them all the time say, I can't talk about what I've done today at home. Well, I, ha I have a, a BS card to throw down on that. Of course you can talk about it at home, but you have to talk about it in a way that's palatable to you, the person that you're that you're living with, and with your kids. And we're going to tell you it's not black or white. It's not tell all or tell nothing. Okay. It, it can be as much as, as simple as saying, "Look, I saw something today. I hope I never have to see again." Uh, I've talked about it eight times at work already, and we've already done six debriefings. I don't think I can go over it again. Um, it was really terrible. And um, what I really need from you is, um, can you give me like 40 minutes? I want to go out for a run. Or can you give me a back rub? Or can you, can you not cook me barbecued ribs? Or not, <laughs> you know, what, you know, whatever, say what exactly that you're going through. Yeah. Because your family's reading you the minute you walk through the door. And they they want to know what what face is he wearing tonight. I'll mm. use the 
thrown out, but we, we know there's women in policing. That what what's what's that face mean? And if if you look angry or disturbed, they're gonna think it's about them, not mm -hmm. about you, unless you make unless you explain yourself. So that's a really important um thing for families to remember. When I was, you know, on the street, well, I spent 25 years on the street, I was quick to share a funny moment. Because you mm -hmm. know, police work is filled with them. You know, you, you'll never guess what I saw today. You know, <laughs> like, or, and I've known cops that could have made a living out of being stand-up comics. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just—it was. Adam is one of them. If you talk to him, yes. Yes, I mean, it just—it's it, it, amazing to me how funny some of these cops are. Yeah, it just—it just blows my mind. And this, the street. You know, the best part about being on the street was every day was a new thing. And, you know, it's like sometimes, you know, you have a boring night and then other nights, you know, it's like there's the naked woman with the samurai sword. Right. You know, you're like, and then, you know, your boss is behind and is like, Mrs. O'Donnell, put down the sword. Why is your mom doing this, O'Donnell? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I was a rookie. And, <laughs> and you know, he's diffusing this potentially lethal situation. And he's just and then we had her laughing. Obviously, yeah. she was having like a psychotic episode. She wasn't all there. There was alcohol and drugs and other stuff going on. And, you know, she's screaming all kinds of stuff. And, you know, my sergeant's behind me. He's, he's like, Mrs. O'Donnell, put down that sword. Pat, why why is your mom doing this? Yeah. And so everybody there started laughing, including the girl with the sword. Yeah. So it just stuff like that. Yeah. You, know, you just can't make it up. It just it happens. So I was always quick to, you know, share something like that. And, you know, the ugly stuff, yeah, I'd share some of it, but, you know, it's like in when you're knee deep in it as a cop or boss, and if you're on the street, you know, you think that you just brush it off because tomorrow there's going to be something new. Yeah. But here's where cops make them a big mistake. They think the job doesn't follow them home. Right. Follows you home. You're, like I said, your family is reading you and you may think you're doing a good job of hiding it and but they get it. You're not you nobody can hide some of the nobody can hide it. And I think people fool themselves when they think that they are hiding it. The other thing is that you know unless unless you have committed some sort of uh, illegal act and married a child, you're married to another adult. Right. And it should not be the cop who makes this a unilateral decision about what gets talked about. That's something that young families for new or new relationships, people should sit down with each other and negotiate that. And some people will say, you can tell me about anything that happens to you on the job. Just don't tell me about something that involves a child or a dog, sure. you know, and that's it. But it's not the officer's decision alone it has to be the two of you and you know I hear cops all the time say I open the door I come home from work I've been solving all problems all day long and the first thing she does or he does is hit me with a problem yeah. so I mean, again that's negotiable give me you know what I need to decompress or let's talk about those we'll make a date to, my husband and I have a business I'm not saying we're the model for anything but that we have a business meeting every morning. We sit down and we talk about what's okay. on his schedule, what's my schedule, et cetera. So, yeah. I mean, there has to be some consistent communication about what's really going on in the lives of all the people involved. Interesting. Very interesting. So you break up a typical police career into phases in your book, which I thought was spot on. I think this would be useful to our listeners who are authors who are writing police stories. Can you dig into it a little bit? I can. Um, well, it just it just seemed that there was that actually I was influenced by a guy named he was a police chief in Walnut Creek and his last name is Swanson and so long ago I've forgotten his first name. But he actually wrote a paper on this for uh, I guess police college or. Uh, mm something. And I, yeah. I thought it was very useful. And I, so I did some more research on it. You know, this job changes you from the day you walk in there and you are sort of 
hopeful and naive and uh, and sort of drunk with the novelty of it and uh, and drunk with sometimes newfound power or money. Um, I mean, like you said, if you're 21, when you start this job, you haven't maybe gotten a lot of life experience. Right. Um, particularly if you've been in, you know, college and just, you know, sort of skated through and had a happy life. Although we don't find that many cops who have had happy lives. Um, but <laughs> to begin with. Um, so that and that novelty will wear off and people will move from being committed to the community and then they get more more uh, attached to their brethren in the blue and then their and then and their own personal needs like salaries and shifts and promotions and they'll be a number of what my uh, friend Andy O'Hara who's a retired C a California Highway Patrol officer calls soul woundings. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? Soul woundings, okay. Those are the little bumblebee stings of thing, the disappointments, the fears, the the stuff you couldn't help, the the tragedies, because cops are exposed to so much tragedy, even if it doesn't affect them personally, safety-wise that they just got there after, but they've seen it and uh, and uh, seen the cruelty that can happen in this world. And uh, it, so that stuff starts to build up and you be, and that stuff starts to build up. And then also you get disappointed in many departments, not all departments, but you get disappointed by the way you're treated in-house. I mean, we all know that uh, organizational stress out outruns um, line of duty stress in oh, all day any, long. Absolutely. Yeah, any study I've ever seen. So that, that begins to happen. You begin to sometimes get hardened and get a bunch of uh, become somewhat narrow minded. And if you, if all you have in life is this single identity, uh, you know, this is who I am being a cop and you have no other sources of either positive input or um, other interests in life, if your life is totally built on that one pillar and then you fail to get a promotion you think you deserve or you get a citizen's complaint and you get some time on the beach and you feel like your department has thrown you under the bus, that pillar crumbles and that's all you got. Sure. So one of the mistakes cops make is putting their, all of their eggs in one basket over which they have no control. This is what I see when cops retire mm -hmm. is like how well adjusted they are going through their careers. And there's ups and downs. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. And the internal stress is a hundred times more powerful than the external stress. Yeah. It's like, am I going to get shot? Am I going to get infected with, you know, like HIV or from a dirty needle or something like that, or hepatitis, oh, yeah. you know, we worry about that, but the worry of this chief is going to, throw me under the bus because the optics of this arrest aren't good. It was on the evening news. I did everything correct per SOP rules and regs state and federal laws. You know, I didn't, I did everything according by the numbers, but it looks terrible. And a lot of police work is just plain ugly to the naked eye. You know, there's just, there are lawful uses of force that just look super ugly. They, to the untrained eye and somebody who's never done or been involved in anything like that, all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, they're terrible. And then, you know, a politician sees that and is like, oh my God, this is terrible. They go running to the sheriff or the chief or whoever. And, you know, you don't know if you're going to get fired or not for doing right. the right thing. That's right. That's right. So that's why we need culturally competent clinicians who will have confidential practices, who will deal with officers because we have a, a, we tell a story in the Counseling Cops book about an officer who had been in three fatal shootings and was having terrible nightmares and just thought, I, I can't do this work anymore. And he goes to see a clinician who says to him, uh, so are you ready to stop being a trained killer? 
Oh my God. Oh. Isn't that a horrible thing? I mean, this oh. guy's like a victim. Yes. How come these things happened on my watch? How come I had to do that? I come that man. Right. You know, so in unless people understand, and there's very little understanding. You ask me, do I get people thanking me for my book? I also get a slew of people who are not cops who just for some reason picked up the book and read it or who read my fiction because I try to talk about these things in sure. my fiction as well, who say to me, thank you very much. I didn't know that about police work. Mm. I didn't understand what cops go through. I'm Next time I get pulled over, if I get pulled over, I'm going to be much nicer to that police officer <laughs> or I'm going to say hello to one when I pass him. Yeah, you know, when we would get a new batch of rookies from the academy, you know, I want to, in the latter part of my career, you know, I was day shifts. So there'd be an orientation at the district station that they're assigned to. And one of the first things I always said was, please, please, please hold on to your regular friends. You are going to become tribal. This is a tribal organization. And you're going to think to yourself, nobody's going to understand me. You know, it's like you have friends now that aren't cops. Hang on to them. You need to be around people who don't think like you. You right. need to be around different people because totally. after a while, you know, it's really easy to get into that whole mindset of these are the only people that understand me. I can only be around them. And that's, that's when bad stuff actually, I mean, some of it's good. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, some of my best friends are cops that I worked with, you know, forever, but I always held on to my friends that I've known since college. You know, I have a, I have a core group of buddies that, I've stayed with that are from all different walks of life com think completely differently than I do when it comes to politics or religion or whatever. And that's a good thing. You have to, you have to be cognizant of that. Well, and I, I wish think felt that way. Well, you know, I think that, like I said before, maybe you think that way when you start out, but all it takes is a couple of like critical incidents or something really hairy and you don't want to talk to your friends. You know, it's like, I remember, you know, I alluded to before, you know, I'm working midnight to eight. One of the great things about that was I got to do a lot of stuff with my kids, like with field trips and all that kind of stuff. And I was like one of the only dads doing it. You know, everybody else was working during the day or what have you. And inevitably, you know, my kids are in Cub Scouts or whatever. And my kids went to private school, went to Catholic school. And I'd have all these people coming up to me that had a lot more money than I did. I mean, we were just scraping by so we could send our kids to these schools. And they wanted to hear police stories. They didn't want to know about me. I know. They, and, and they always find out. I mean, and I wasn't wearing a police shirt. I didn't have a badge on my head. Yeah. You know, I, I wasn't wearing a badge necklace. I wasn't, you know, strutting around like, hey, look at me, Mr. Cop. They always know every time. That somebody's going to say something. Oh, tell me a story. Tell me a story. And you're just like, ah, I'm running on no sleep. Yeah. And I really don't want to talk about it right now. You know, it's so it's easy to get disenfranchised. Well, it is. But I would have to say to you that. That. Rather than being defensive. When that happens, I would tell cops, look, people are really interested in what you do. Why yeah. do we 1700 TV shows about cops because <laughs> right. it really grabs everybody. So how about just assuming that this person's interest is, is legitimate and not malevolent and they're not out to, you know, now some people are out to complain about a ticket they got or sure. why didn't you see them in the leg and the, the latest you know, the, the cops are all racist. There, there are people that are very aggressive and um, not well-meaning, but there's also a lot of people who are simply just interested in what you do. And I would say to cops, rehearse a nice way to say, you know, uh, I mean, I get that too. It's a psychologist. I can, sure. be, I can be at a cocktail party and somebody comes up and they want they want to talk to me about their schizophrenic Uncle Herman. <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm, and so I say to them, you know, I'm not working now. That's beyond my pay grade. Um, um, I'm really tired. I'm at, out to have some fun tonight. 
um, thanks for your interest, but you know, I'm, I'm really not, um, it's not, I don't want to talk about this, right? I mean, there are nicer ways. Than yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. If I was in your shoes, what I would say is like, well, my fee is $350 an hour. Let's I go find a that. couch. You can go lay down and <laughs> let's do this. <laughs> I have said that, or when people ask me about some things to do with themselves, you know, why do I always, and I'll say, sorry, I only take easy cases. <laughs> and that tends to get a laugh most of the time. And then we move on. So sure, sure. The, the problem is that cops often overestimate. Oh, it depends on what's where you are, what city you're in, what the la latest scandal has been, sure. what the latest news stuff has been. But cops often overestimate how much or underestimate how much people appreciate what they do. I, I would keep on telling my cops at roll calls, et cetera, that, you know what, 90% of the people, or maybe even more love you guys. They yeah. want you in those streets. They want you helping them, but yeah. the most vocal are the very small minority that don't like you. And, you know, they want to get you, catch you doing, you know, X, Y, or Z, or, you know, there's, there's malice there. You know, right. you know, be on your guard for that, but just have it in the back of your head that most of these people, not to be, you know, like looking through rose colored glasses, but they do love you. They like you. They want you there. No matter where you're working, they do want you there. And it, they, there's so much negativity in police work. Most of it coming internally from the organization and the culture. A lot of it coming also from the public itself that um, police officers have to work especially hard to put things in their lives and in their families' lives that are positive. Yeah, it, absolutely. But it's difficult when, you know, I live in Wisconsin. We had the shooting in Kenosha where that officer was fighting with the, um, with the subject. I, I forget the names. And the, the officer had to shoot this person in the back, I think like three or four times. The governor, our leader of the state that night said, this is obviously due to systemic racism, mm -hmm. that this officer shot this man in the back, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then the last line of his press release was, but I don't know all the facts. Yeah, right. So right. why would you even say that until you know all the facts? So I wrote, I, I blog with Psychology Today occasionally. I owe them some blogs. And after the Parkland shooting, uh, same story, with less than 24 hours, and they pilloried that cop who's, I forget his name, Peterson, the, the school resource officer. Oh, yeah, they said he ran away. Yeah, so they, and I knew it turns out he didn't do his job, apparently. He turns out that way. But I knew they couldn't know that within 24 hours. Absolutely. And so I wrote this blog about the, the dangers of jumping to conclusions over things like that. Because, and, that and people who think they are going to know exactly how they'll feel when their life is in, in the balance <laughs> yeah. um, is almost like saying, I know exactly how I'm going to feel if I'm pregnant and have a child. You can, these are these are things that you only can imagine how you'll feel and the way you will actually feel when it happens can be radically different. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right because, you know, it's like where I worked, especially at night, you're around, you're surrounded by live gunfire. We had yeah. shot spotters that would, you know, like tell us where this gunfire was. It was just a fact of police work. That was a fact of life in these neighborhoods. And I think there's something wrong with us. And I say that in a joking way. It's like, we would like in a tactical way, go running towards it. You know, yeah. in more than one situation they're in a bar and, you know, whatever, there's a sea of people running out and you could hear the gunfire and we're running in, you know, that's, and you don't know how you're going to react to that until you do it. Right. Right. You, you just don't know. And it's like, okay, you, you may think, you know, and you may think, Hey, I'm a tough guy. I'm this, I'm that until the stuff hits the fan, you, yep. you really don't know how you're going to react. So in the I Love a Cop book, I call that the breakdown of adaptive denial because 
and if we talk about, I've talked about this in many different places, but um, police officers have to operate under a, set, a certain set of beliefs. When I teach um, stress, not stress management, but self-care for cops, which I could think of a better name. Um, and we talk about the beliefs that cops have, which is that people will be better off because I'm there, that I can control other people. I can control my own emotions. I mean, there's a whole list of things. And when that breaks down, because it, I mean, it's you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get out of bed and go to work if you didn't believe those things about yourself and your right. abilities. The problem is that those beliefs are unrealistic. So we have to teach cops how to sort of modify that. Like a good cop always wins a fight. Well, a good cop sometimes wins a fight. Uh, otherwise, people then we see cops um, filled with shame because sure. they thought they hesitated and maybe they hesitated three seconds. I mean, like they could overcome thousands of years of hard wiring and <laughs> evolution right. of human beings um, or that they, they cried on the job. Good heavens, how much shame is involved with that? And we say, look, you're, you're human. That's the problem is that you're, human and so we have to help cops be more realistic about their own limitations and sure. you know policing is all about control as you know yes. and if people think that i can't control myself they're in trouble so they then do over controlling everything now in the book you alluded to the fact that sometimes cops stay on the job when they shouldn't you know, not, right. not everybody should be a cop. It's just like, you know, it's, I don't believe in a draft, a military draft, because I don't think everybody can be a soldier. You know, it, it's just not everybody can do that job. Now I do believe in public service and I wouldn't have a problem with people getting out of high school and having to do like a mandatory one or two years of public service. And maybe that would be some kind of guarantee or, a severe reduction in tuition for college or trade school. You know, I think there's, there's solutions, you know, there's, there's solutions to these things, but you know, it can't be free. You know, you, you got to work for it, but right. that's just, that's my, that's my belief. But I have seen time and time again, where there was cops that were just miserable 24 seven. And it's like, you're a, a square peg trying to get into a round hole. I mean, what do you, what are your feelings on that? Well, I, I have said this many times and nobody pays attention to this, is what I'm going to say now, is that we should not ask people to do this job for 20, 25 or 30 years. Uh, I'd much rather see um, opportunities to like more like the military. You sign up mm. for a number of years Oh, okay. And, then, and, then, and you get your retirement vested per the year that you've worked. Mm. Uh, now, that is impractical. The police chiefs will tell me it costs so much money to hire and train Correct. people. Yeah, well, I think they get their money back after about the fifth year. I'm not sure how people figure that out, but I've heard that. And then other people say, well, it takes five years or 15 years to become a good cop. Maybe, maybe not. Um, and yes, to be constantly recruiting, particularly today when recruiting is so difficult and challenging. For right. People, that I see the impracticalities out of that. But but unless you have been uh, promoted or find your particular sweet spot in that job, uh, the job, and this sort of alludes to your next question too, the job um, can prepare you to do a number of other things as well. But if your morale is bad, if you are... Um, uh, you know, not taking care of yourself, you're drinking too much, uh, you're addicted to um, over-the-counter meds or some other kind of meds, if you, your family is failing, if you get up every morning and hate going into work, I mean, why do that? Why stay there? But cops have a, they're kind of weird in a way. And my friend Al Better, who is a, one of the early police psychologists and retired as a captain out of uh, 
San Francisco PD. Is it, it, Al died of cancer a few years ago. Um, he used to, he used to shudder when I would say this, but the cops would run into right, like you said, where we hear the gunshots, they're yep. running gunshots, but you get them to spend a dime on themselves. Mm -mm, they're not going there. The yeah. department did it to me. They're I'm going to hang in there until they pay me. That's true. Even if, even even if I'm ready to kill myself, it's going to they're going to pay me for it. So. I mean, it's kind of odd that need for that certain need for security and the ability to risk, take risks with yourself physically. Well, I, there's a couple of things going on, I think, with cops that I have seen through the years. One is finances. You know, you start working overtime, you get promotions or whatever, you start making more money. And that's the lifestyle that you're leading. You have families, you know, like I said, I had, you know, kids in private school, whatever. I couldn't quit if I wanted to, you know, there's no way, you know, I had a four-year degree in sociology. My minor was criminal justice. Yeah. There wasn't any jobs out there making this kind of money or the opportunity to make this kind of money. Did you look? No, I did not. I'll be a hundred percent honest. I just, you know, I just remember when I was in college, it's like, okay, I could be a social worker. They make half of what a cop makes. Right. And a lot of the cops, I'm sure you met them too. They get the job and suddenly they have all these things with wheels and big engines, <laughs> a big house that is yeah. speaking, speaking personally, I never had a big house in my life. I still don't have one. And I don't get paid if I don't work. I don't get sick leave. I don't get vacation leave. And I manage, I manage to be quite comfortable. Thank you. So I I think that the the people are driven to the job often for the security of it. Yes. And then they we don't show young cops how not lit to live beyond their means to start living true. on their own. That's true. Plus, I think a big thing too is you don't want to be seen as a quitter. You don't want to be seen, and it's like okay, I. It's it's really a tough job. It's really taking a toll on me instead of saying, you know what, my mental health is worth more to me. My relationships are more, worth more to me. I'm going to step away and do X, Y, or Z. A lot of cops will dig in their heels and it's like, no, I'm going to figure this out, but I'm not going to quit and I'm not going to let down, you know, the guys that I work with. And we we all know the cops that they fell in love with the job. And, you know, retirement slaps them in the face or maybe they get hurt or they're forced to retire and they figure out that the job doesn't love them back. And That's they're right. so hurt by that. That's right. Uh, we, uh, I work, I volunteer at the First Responder Support Network where we um, take, we have two kinds of retreats. One's for first responders with symptoms of PTSD and the other is for their families. And one of our uh, volunteer peers, it's a peer, peers and clinicians running this together is a guy named Joe. And he had, um, he was a cop and he had a heart condition, came mm. on him early. And he said that he, he went home and nobody called him from the department. Yep. He, all my friends I thought were, you know, friends for life. Nobody came by. And I sat on the couch, he said, with now my two best friends depression and anger. Yeah. So, yeah, and, well, so there's an uptick in cops. Who and I to... think that gets tougher once you promote or you get into a specialty unit. You think that, you know what, it's not going to run unless I'm there. I'm that important. And yeah. my answer to that was always police departments and most like formal organizations are built to where if you fall off a cliff tomorrow and you're gone, the wheels are going to keep spinning. Sorry. Okay. So one of the, uh, I say this too, and it usually gets a big groan from people um, that the one of the occupational hazards of being a police officer or other kinds of first responders is self-inflation. Thinking, you know, more than other people thinking you're more important yeah. than you actually are. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, you mentioned that police officers gain valuable skills throughout their careers that they're often blind to. What are some, and you know, what are some ways we could leverage that? Uh, 
Well, I think that depending upon the job market and the economy, if people understand that if cops and that cops will frequently say, I'm sure you've heard this, I, I don't know how to be anything else. Well, come on, it's not rocket science. So of course you can. And when you're a cop, you have learned a number of very important skills that employers value. Time management, the ability to make a decision, the ability to communicate and articulate things. I mean, policing is no longer a blue collar job. No, you're, it's you're not. constantly dealing with computers and analytics and all kinds of uh, program development. So if officers could learn to put different words on what their skills are. Almost like when we started the housewives, when they started to get back into the job market, had to be able to articulate then change the words on what they do. They've been managing the household finances so they know how to run a budget. You know, So if we could help officers put different words and examine their own skill level that but the work ethic amongst police officers is fantastic. It sure is. Yes. So there is a, I did an interview for this man whose name I forget. He runs something called cop to corporate. Have you ever heard of them? No, never did. Okay. He's got, he's a web, another website. I'm going to, I'll try to find his, um, yeah. You know, Give me a second here. I'll look for it. Um, okay. yeah. yeah, you can just email that to me All later, right, and then I'll, I'll, th I'll, I'll throw it in the show notes. He's um, good. because he, He's trying to do just what I said. And also, you know, people may, officers may have to learn how to speak differently. To yes. Civilians, you know, if they if they if they are uh, a little too badge heavy, it won't work. So they'll uh, need to learn a different way to talk to people sometimes. But it's not impossible. And they bring, I mean, you can't be stupid really and be a cop. Well, I suppose you can, but you won't last very long. If right. Stupid. Right. So uh, there's just all kinds of really good things I think that cops can bring to the corporate sector, to the uh, uh, public health, to all different places. And so part of what this man does with his website is also have some stories of positive change of officers who have actually left law enforcement and gone on to do something different. Sure. Very good. All right. Let's talk a little bit about PTSD. You know, almost every book regarding our conversation when it comes to cops and maybe troubles or whatever, it circles back to PTSD. Does anybody ever get quote unquote cured from this? All the time. Okay. We call it, we call it at the first re responders retreat. We say this is post-traumatic stress injury. It's like any other injury you've ever had. And uh, with proper care and some uh, good treatment, yes, you will be cured of it. Do you lose the memory for the thing that, that caused it or the th things that caused it? Um, no, because the memories are who we are. That's our life, sure. our biography. But no, we can absolutely, we can absolutely cure it for sure. Now, what we find is that some people are more at risk for PTSD than others. Okay. Anybody with a any history of childhood abuse or neglect, um, or the who, people who come to us with a whole series of unprocessed traumas um, that they've just sort of, you know, shoved under the rug. Um, those people are more at risk. If you have some bad coping habits like drinking, mm. um, overeating, whatever, you know, having affairs, that sort of thing, um, that makes you uh, more at risk too. But, and so we, we have to deal with people on those issues. About 85%, I would say, of the people who show up at the, the of the first responders who come to the first responder support network for help, I'd say about 85 of them come from uh, homes that were very dysfunctional. Mm. And and we have a, we sort of have a joke. The retreat is six days long. We have a joke, which is if you just tell us about your absent 
narcissistic alcoholic father, we could cut about three days off this retreat. <laughs> um, because sometimes it's the mother, not the father. Right. But that we find that that somebody once joked around and said, if it wasn't for dysfunctional families, we wouldn't have any cops or firefighters. That's very when, true. Yes. And when you think about it, when you grow up in chaos, when you have had to be the premature adult in your family because your parents are not capable of taking care of you or taking care of you in a loving way, um, in a healthy way, uh, then then being comfortable with chaos is great training for being a cop. It's like a, just a smooth segue from one to the other because you've been controlling stuff and been a premature adult for forever. See, I think with cops, you know, because that's the world that, you know, I, I grew, I didn't grow up in, but, you know, I was a part of for 25 years. We almost think it's normal. You know, I'll tell you my own experience. What happened was, you know, my first marriage, it was going down the tubes and I talked to my now ex-wife and I said, you know, we should go to a marriage therapist. We should go see, see a marriage counselor. And she said, no, I don't believe in them. I'm like, okay, I'll go by myself. So I went by myself. And, you know, the, this, I think she was a psychologist and she was great. She, she reminded me of the principal from kindergarten cop. She was a very small, petite woman that was just very vocal though. Yeah. You, know, you didn't expect it coming out of her. Yeah. You know? And she looked at me and she said, do you realize you have like a heap of PTSD? And I'm like, no, I, no, I do not. And she said, oh, yeah, it's really bad with you. And I said, well, I, I've never had somebody tell me that before. And I was, like, shocked. And then as she was talking about it, I'm like, hmm, okay. yeah. But to me, that was normal. You know, and it's like, and, I mean, I wasn't dysfunctional. You know, I wasn't missing work. I wasn't, you know, beating my kids up. I wasn't kicking the dog. I wasn't doing anything like that. But you know, there was instances of you know, like flashbacks, not sleeping, you know, waking up, like screaming, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it did subside with time. Mm -hmm. And then I started writing this Bruce city blues uh, fiction. It all started coming back again because it was all stories. And a lot of them were just like funny stories. There weren't like terrible things or whatever, but it triggered other stuff. And I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> hey, we're back. Hey, uh, it's like, all right. Right. Well, and that's one of the things we do at the retreat is we, we teach people how to deal with triggers because there's no expiration date for traumatic memories. Yeah. You know, that some I often say that PTSD is like the inability to forget. Yeah. So, you know, I, with you. Yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, I was thinking about it. I, I read the book Tribe by Sebastian Younger. It's a great uh -huh. book. And he was talking about soldiers that who had PTSD and that went through like horrific things like, you know, their buddy next to him has his head literally blown off or something along those lines. And they wouldn't go to support groups because there were so many phonies in the group and they uh -huh. could spot them 100 miles away. And they're like, I don't want to be clumped in with them. You know, as a therapist, what do you do with somebody that I don't, maybe not the, the word phony isn't correct, but somebody, you know, that's kind of a crybaby or a whiner. Okay. I have two answers to your question. Okay. One is that um, everybody thinks that the other person is a phony and a crybaby and living off the, you know, living off their, their unwarranted um, the payout. So now they, that right. they're they're at home on their 50% and all that until, until it happens to them. And then I hear cops say, oh, my God, I thought Jimmy was faking this. And now, I, now I'm in this position and I get it. So that's, that's one answer is that some, the, the, the crybaby faking it is probably maybe somebody's way of just denying and avoiding because they don't want to tell anybody how they're actually feeling. And so they don't want to join the group. Yeah. Okay. Now, a second example is that I'm sitting and doing one of these retreats and at the first responder support network. And we have a man who has both combat experience as well as police experience. 
and he's telling us some horrible stories about, I think it was Afghanistan, I don't remember. And he's become so upset that he's, he, he goes into the bathroom and throws up. And we can hear him because we're in the yeah. next room throwing up. And uh, my co-therapist and I and our, our you know, we're all, everyone's really engaged in this guy's troubles. Sure. And some of the, we work this peer team. We have cops that have been through the program. And one of the cops, uh, one of our peers, who's a cop, says, I think that guy's a phony. And oh. goes and, and looks him up. And lo and behold, long story short, in fact, what he was saying was absolutely untrue. His wow. buddy that killed in his arms is still alive and living in Pennsylvania. <laughs> okay. And 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 this the guy is really what he's trying to do is escape some discipline at work and get out on a stress disability retirement. Yep. He wasn't fake. And neither my cl a fellow clinician or I, with all of our years of experience, could spot that. It took a cop to spot that, which is why I absolutely love working as part of a team that has sure. first responders, clinicians, and a chaplain. We need all of us to do this work. So yeah, there of course there are people that have secondary gain and looking for that. And if you discover them, you have to you have to do something about it. Kick them out of therapy or something. Gotcha. Yeah, that's unfortunate, but it is true. And I've I've seen it firsthand and it's disgusting, you know, because it stains the people who actually need help okay. and that are unable to do the job anymore because of it. You know, and it's <laughs> and it's you know, the extreme is I'm not gonna say who it is, but I had a friend who was shot like four or five times and one of them was point blank in the back of his head. And he survived. And he survived his physical wounds, which were pretty extensive. And he went back to full duty. He was never the same. And, you know, I would talk to him every now and then. He was one of my cops when he was a rookie. You know, he went on to a different, you know, assignment, et cetera. And I, we, we'd see each other in passing. And I'm like, hey, how are you doing? You know, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, yeah, doing good, Sarge. He said, I thought I'd be a wreck, but he's like, I'm doing pretty good. And I'm like, well, God bless you. Go forth and you know, be you. But like two years later, I saw him and he says, you know, and I was like, how are you doing? And he's like, really bad. I can't sleep. It's coming back really, really bad. And the worst part is the city is saying, hey, you know what? You didn't have these problems right after the shooting or like a month or two after the shooting. Now it's two years later. Now all of a sudden you're having these problems, right. you know, and they were trying to deny him a duty disability retirement. And this guy was shot like four or five freaking times. We, we um, encounter this all the time. The workers' compensation system has become a horrible thing. The, the thing it was designed to avoid, probably the worst part of going through PTSD for many officers was how they're treated by workers' comp. Um, or by their departments. Uh, we do not at the First Responder Support Network, we do not write, we're not interested in whether people go back to work or not. We want them to make the healthiest decision they can for themselves. Right. We do not, we do, not do fitness for duty evaluations. We do not give people opinions about whether this person should go back to work or not. That's not our job. And um, it, and the, the idea of, that somebody could uh, be like leading even a normal life or one or one of the things that we're very careful about is we don't keep notes. If we write down anything, it gets um, shredded before we leave. Mm. Because as I mentioned, about 85% of our clients have had some childhood abuse. Well, if that gets into the workers' compensation hands, they're going to say that's what caused the PTSD, oh, okay. not what happened on the job. So sure. we want people to talk to us about this. It's very important that they give that up. I did a retreat once. We have only six clients at a time, which is a, an interesting business model, but that's we can only handle six. And with all six men, for the first time in their lives, admitted to having been uh, sexually abused as children. Wow. And all we could do was laugh. I mean, it seemed it was so absurd. And that they would all said things like, that only happens to girls, and it, that it happened to me makes me somehow weak or horrible. Right. 
and, and but we can't that information has to stay confidential because it will be abused it'll yes. be brought up and it will and it will be abused and we are not you know all the, we go over the rules of confidentiality with our clients early in the game first afternoon and to assure them that unless that abuser is still out there abusing people we do not have to it's not a mandatory report at all okay Wow, that's something else. So, you know, we alluded to organizational stress before. And, you know, I believe it's the number one stressor for a cop. And, yeah. you know, I think that explains why police suicides kind of run later on in cops' careers. You know, I think I read a stat, I don't know if I saw it or what, wherever that ordinarily, officers that kill themselves have like at least 20 years on the job 15 is the I, I, 15? I, the, the most likely if you're looking at making a chart the okay. big in the 15th year all right and a lot of it is organizational stress and obviously there's other influences that can do that now with police suicide what are you looking for you know say somebody's listening to this and they have a friend that's a cop and it's like, what are the signs to look for and how? what's the best way to help? Uh, best way to help is to get their guns away. First thing. And that's a remember, tough one. That's toughy. Yeah, you know, that. That's why yeah. they can help kill themselves. Get yeah, guns. I know. But I'm just saying that I agree with what you're saying, but that's a tough road because that's part of the identity and it might make things worse. I know I've, I, I've, I've had that experience myself, but in you watching the wanting to do is to put time between somebody's impulse to kill themselves and give them some time because most people who have tried to kill themselves actively, or, you know, we know this about people that jump off the Golden Gate Bridge and somehow survive, they, sure. they regret that decision. So you want to you want to get as much time as possible. I have a, a tell of sitting in a man's house for about five hours with two of his colleagues waiting for him to sober up. So and then then we he sobered up and then we were able to get him into a hospital voluntarily so we didn't lose his ability to carry a weapon. Um, so the signs that you are cops are really good at masking stuff, right? They are. Street all the time so you everyone's shocked he was the happiest guy yeah and, and i we thought he had everything together right so uh very often you can't tell in advance but it, the the general signs are people that talk about it because you know most people give a little many people give a little warning sign about it who have talked about other people's suicides who seem to be really interested in on newspaper articles about suicide who are uh, have an air of hopelessness about them. Um, they're uh, constantly, they can be irritable all the time. They start giving stuff away. Um, uh, they behave recklessly on the job. They don't put their seatbelt on. They leave their uh, Kevlar at home. They drive too fast. Um, that they may have, we know that more than organizational stress. Now, see, people don't, re we don't have proper research on this yet. Mm -hmm. I'd say more than organizational stress is a loss of a relationship. Now, the relationship may be I'm about to lose my job and all the relationships that came with the job. Sure, sure. That's why people that are put off on an early retirement to, uh, because of an injury or disciplinary issue or something, uh, are uh, quite at risk for suicide. People who drink a lot because uh, uh, intoxication is associated with uh, you, you lose your you lose your um, inhibitions when you drink. Sure. So it's, it's just easier to pick up the weapon. But somebody who's going through a divorce um, or the uh, has the law somebody that's just lost a spouse to death or a child to death. Um, I mean, those people are definitely um at risk and and you should be as much as you can be talking to them um it's really hard to negotiate with someone who is drunk as you know <laughs> yes and and it's important to um 
Well, you don't want to lecture at somebody and you want to hopefully get them to talk about their pain, then the fact that they think that their only option left in in life is to take their life because their family will be better off or the department will be better off. Um, you want to make them feel as guilty as possible. Mm. Now that sounds like a weird thing to do, yeah. but you got to say, you know, you, you want to do this to your kids. You know how many kids of people who kill themselves are more likely to kill themselves. Mm. You know, you, you know, you want, you want to let them see what the effect of their suicide is going to have on others. And hopefully that will cause them to think it through another time because, um, and then I say to people, you want to hurt your family for generations to come kill yourself because that's what happens. Well, people I liken it to throwing a hand grenade in a room full of people that you love. That, exactly. I love that. That's a great, that's a great description. And I've used that more than one time. And being a sergeant, part of my job was some of the unpleasant stuff of arresting police officers, uh, taking them to the hospital because they were having a mental health, you know, like breakdown or they were suicidal. And I've done all of that. And the diciest stuff was usually they were intoxicated and it's like, where's your gun? I don't, ha I don't have it, Sarge. I'm like, yeah, you do. Where's your gun? And, you know, it, or their gun would be on their person. Or it's where like, are your guns, plural? Because yeah, no right. But those were some of the, I mean, I've had some dicey, I've had bullets miss my head by a couple of feet two mm. different times on the job. But the diciest times I've ever had was taking a gun away from a cop. It's, it's horrible. I mean, I've been part of arresting cops for illegal activities. I mean, not me personally, I was witness to it. Yes. And, and and what you're saying, and yet it's it's. I got a call from somebody maybe a month, six weeks ago, someone I hadn't seen for years, who uh, who had a family member, an officer who was drunk and very suicidal. And I said the first, both. So it was a two generation cops in one family, mm -hmm. and I said, got to go and get his guns first, and they refused. Didn't, didn't want to, the embarrassment, I guess. Yeah. I don't, and I, I, I haven't heard from them, so I don't know what happened. Yeah, it, it it's tough. And what opened my eyes was I was a newer sergeant and I got called to a police suicide. And the person who killed themselves was a cop that I wasn't best friends with, but I knew him. Mm -hmm. And we were like in a big group out drinking and having fun like a month before that. Now I'm in the room and his brains are splattered, like literally all over the wall. And, you know, he came from a cop family. Now all these, you know, dad was a cop, you know, and now here comes everybody. You know, it's like, hey, this is a crime scene. You can't come in and just, I won't go through it. But like I said before, it's literally like rolling a hand grenade in there and just blowing up everybody you love. Yep. That's a really great way to describe it. Oof. But let's let's look a little bit further down the road. Retirement. Yeah, you in the book you said retirement is a time when it's safe to fall down. Can you can you explain that? If you are, um, somebody said to me once, I'm going to retire here with a duffel bag of bad dreams. They had a whole bunch of stuff unprocessed that they were um, not they couldn't deal with it because you know the stigma of reaching out for help when you're a cop thinking it means you're weak so they hadn't processed anything so now that they no longer have to be perfect they can actually grow your hair and <laughs> public and 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 you don't have to be perfect anymore now if you if that's the situation that you find yourself in now get go and talk to somebody Get some therapy, unload this stuff. And, and the reason I say it's safe to fall down is an experience of my own. Many years ago, I was hiking in the Himalayas. Oh, wow, that's cool. And it was the end of the monsoon season and I was on a narrow path that was sort of muddy and parts of the path had fallen out. So I had to, you know, had to jump over gaps on the road and, uh, the drop to the river below was about a thousand feet, right to my left, right there. Oh, wow. 
and it was pretty scary. And uh, my, I was hiking with my ex, who is a very tall man. I'm barely five feet tall. And so he was really way far ahead of me. So I'm basically alone and I was really frightened. But I kept going because I'm Mighty Mouse. You know, I kept going <laughs> and I got there. I come home to my house in California and I am not home more than 24 hours when I fall down the back stairs and sit on the bottom step and sob for an hour. And when I got myself together and thought about it, I thought, that the moral of that story was I didn't fall down until it was safe to fall down. Mm, okay. It was safe to fall down in the middle of that hiking path. So that's the, and that's my analogy for retirement is that it's okay now to fall down. It's okay. Look for the parts of yourself that you've lost. Um, there's another wonderful story that comes out of our retreats about a guy who on um, on th he's retired for, as a cop and on Thanksgiving Day, his wife is making dinner. She sends him to the, the grocery store because she needs something. And as he goes into the grocery store, there's like four homeless people leaning on the, the side of the grocery store. And he, and he thinks to himself, nobody should go through Thanksgiving without turkey. So he walks over to these guys and he says, which one of you is the chief bum? And one of them sticks his hand out and our cop puts a 20 in his hand and says, go in and buy yourself some turkey sandwiches, knowing full well, they'd probably buy themselves some wild turkey. I was just going to say, yeah, that, that's the turkey, yes. And what he said he felt at the moment was that he had got back a part of himself that he had lost. Mm. The cop that he had got back a part of himself that was compassionate and allowed himself to be vulnerable and 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 could didn't have to control what other people did and i think that's what you can do in retirement and i i hope that as people enter retirement their lives are built around many more things than just their job so that like yourself you had other things to turn to your your interest in writing, your interest in podcasts, what, you know, I don't know if you remarried or something, but you had other stuff. Yeah, I did, yes. You know, I'm a huge fan of the expression, dig the well before you're thirsty. Yeah. <laughs> most of us, most of us know when we're going to pull the pin or we have a good idea. Most yeah. cops have a countdown calendar thing on their phone. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, I've got 362 days until I retire. You know, have some kind of plan and be flexible with said plan because things don't always go the way you think they th you think they're going to go but have some kind of plan have a purpose have a mission it doesn't have to be grandiose start out small but have something in mind don't think that you know it's thursday i'm going to turn in all my equipment to the academy on friday i'm going to take the weekend off and then i'll just discover what I want to do. And it's like, okay, no, it doesn't work well that way. So I'd add two things to that. One is make that plan with your family, mm. include them in on that. And the other is that it really can be hard to fill a space, fill that hole that you, you have to make room before you can figure out what you want to do. I've had cops say to me, I don't, they're panicky. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I say to them, you've got to make the space first and then see what dro what drops into it. If not, and if while you're still working, sometimes you can't do that because you don't, you haven't got that space. So allow yourself six months to have that space and see what falls into it. Don't panic. Right. And allow yourself, like I said before, you know, it's like, be flexible, allow yourself some mistakes along the way. They're yeah. going to happen, you know, and that's perfectly fine. For me, the one of the biggest like self-care things I've ever done, I'm a gym rat. I work out six, seven days a week. Oh, I love going to the gym. And when I was, when I was a active cop, I did the same thing. You know, I knew, I knew guys that would have to drink a six pack that work third shift before they could get to sleep in the morning. Yeah. You know, I'd go to the gym or I'd go to the gym when I woke up. And now 
it's a luxury for me. It's like, I'm not rushed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, I can work this into my schedule a lot easier than, you know, I'm working day shift and I get home at 6 PM. I'd have my gym, gym bag packed at the top of the stairs and ready to go. So that reminds me that, I mean, unless you're a compulsive exerciser, um, exercise is one of the best things to do for stress. It, it An hour and a half, 90 minutes of exercise, I think produces another 75% of serotonin, the good, the good feel good. Right. Neurologic. So that's, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. The, for me, I, and you don't have to be an Olympic athlete. You don't have to be a marathon runner. You, you know, even if it's walking around the block a couple of times, you know, just <laughs> do something that, you know, the biggest mistake that I've seen for retirees is they just plop in front of that TV, pop open a six pack and that's their day. And it's like, no, there's a lot more to life. And it, for cops too, they get home from work or whatever. And they're just couch potatoes. Yeah. That's, that doesn't work well, yeah. but I do have some Facebook questions real quick okay. uh, from the cops and writers, Facebook group, Lori Heath, Ellen oh. Kirsten is amazing. Seriously. If you have any questions about PTSD, trauma, and first responders, she is the expert. She's also just a really cool person. Well, thank you, Laurie. And she's married to Craig. Oh, really? Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, John Arnez, excellent book. When I was an FTO, I would loan a copy of I Love a Cop to my trainees and tell them to take it home. Thank Lily you. Gibson says, I have her book with a big explanation and smiley face. And Sharon P. Lynn, my question is, would a cop prefer to come home to a partner who wants to talk about his or her cop day or one who would help him or her forget about forget about it for a while? And I think we covered that. Well, if you're talking um, about two cops who are married to each other, yeah, I, there's a whole chapter in my book about that because that's a different thing. Sometimes that's all you talk about and it's too much. And it gets boring and you need to find other ways and other things to do in the relationship. Um, and so you might want to take a look at that chapter because we really didn't talk about right. married to each other other than the fact that Patrick absolutely decided not to ever do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, author career. You know, what's new with your author career? What's next? What are you writing or are you working on something right now? I am. I'm. I am. Uh, have morphed into a mystery writer. So excellent. I, the Dot Meyerhoff mystery series. Dot Meyerhoff. Dot is my mother's name. Meyerhoff is my grand uh, maternal grandmother's name. That's perfect. Right. That. Dot Meyerhoff is a police psychologist. No surprise. <laughs> So I'm using these mysteries as a vehicle to not just write a good entertaining story, but also to show what goes on behind the badge. Mm. From, because most of the most of the stories in my mysteries are uh, inspired by things that I've at the clients I've had or things I've actually witnessed when I um, was uh, working in departments. Okay. Now and available, I have to say they're available on Amazon. Perfect. And also, uh, there'll be some new ones coming out. And I'm also uh, uh, have a newsletter. If you'd like to sign up for that, go to my website and sign up for my newsletter it comes every other month. I will put a link to your website in Great. the show notes. And those have links to all your books I met on Great. your website. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Here's one of the last questions. I always ask somebody like you who takes care of us, the cops, who takes care of the person who takes care of everybody else? Who takes care of you? Uh, well, I try to take care of myself. I mean, I try to practice what I preach in terms of self-care. I'm uh, married to a wonderful man who uh, does all the cooking, all the shopping, takes the, all the photographs. He's a photographer now, retired mm -hmm. as a remodeling contractor. And uh, takes all my pictures from my uh, website and my backs of my books. So, and I have uh, friends, and I work on my relationship. I am also a. I have a, a spiritual life. Um, you know, it's it's not conventional, but I have one. So I'm by mentioning that I'm 
indicating I'm involved in stuff uh, more than my the drama of my own life. Okay. <laughs> Bigger than the drama yeah. Of my own. And the I reason, love, the reason I why I asked the reason why I asked that question is I read the book. Well, I had listened to the audiobook. It was one of the first audiobooks I've ever listened to. It was called Weekends at Bellevue. Oh, I don't know that. Oh, it's fantastic. What it's about a woman who would go to Bellevue on I think it was Friday morning. She was a psychologist and she wound up being like the head of the psych ward at Bellevue in New York. And she would stay until Monday morning. Mm. And, you know, all the crazy stories, all the, you know, drama and all the, all the stuff like in a big city psych ward, you know, that she experienced. And one of her mentors was like, it's starting to get to you. And she's like, no, it's not. I'm a lot tougher than that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally she had to go into therapy. Well, I'm, I'm, I have a Teflon brain. Uh, and so things don't stick with me. I'm fortunate for that. Uh, things <laughs> don't stick with me very much, but I do take care of myself. And when I okay. need consultation um, with a peer or another, another psychologist, and we at the retreat, we have a staff meeting and we consult with each other and debrief each other at the end of every retreat. So we don't take mm. stuff home with us. Yes. Um, and I exercise regularly and I try to eat decently and I try to um, slow down because I'm a pretty active person. So I try to practice what I, what I preach. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, that never came to my mind until I read that book and I'm mm -hmm. like, you know what, you're bombarded with everybody's problems, yeah. you know, 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week. Who takes care of you? Because that's going to take a toll on you. So, well, I no longer have a private practice. I spend most of my time writing novels now. Excellent. So, yeah. So I don't. I don't have that uh, burden to carry because that that was a burden. Yes. Sure. Was, yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap this up. Okay. Where can people find out more about you and your books? Your website. Where do we go? www ellen kirschman that's spelled e l l e n k i r s c h m a n one word dot com perfect all right well thank you so much for your time it, this has been a lot of fun thank you i appreciate your interest i owe you a couple of emails and i will uh, send them to you i, I appreciate your uh, asking me on it's been fun you're right, right. thank you